<laughs> Emeritus Academy's first lecture in our series for the 2021 school year. I'm Ardeen Nelson, Chair of the Steering Committee. The committee will be meeting next week on Monday, so feel free to email me, nelson.13, with any matter you would like us to take up at that meeting. Due to the virus situation, we'll be presenting lectures via Zoom, that we hope to be able to gather once again in person in the not too distant future. Think about it this way. You can now participate in the lecture series from anywhere in the world via Zoom. You'll notice I'm in Hawaii. Um, during the lecture, please feel free to write your questions via the chat option, which I'm gonna hold on till the end and then present them to TK. To begin today, I'd like to introduce Dr. Helen Malone, Vice Provost for Academic Policy and Faculty Resources. Dr. Malone. Thank you so much, Ardeen. I will keep this brief, but I just wanted to pop in and say welcome to the Emeritus Academy Lecture Series. We're thrilled that even though we're, we're in this unprecedented time where I, I don't know how many hours I spend on Zoom that we can manage another Zoom that we can engage our emeritus faculty in these lecture series and continue to engage over this year. Um, as our Dean said, when, when the university permits events of greater than 10 to occur again, uh, we will do our very best to get these back in person where, where possible. But until that time, uh, on behalf of OAA, we're, we're so excited that you're able to participate um, and welcome you to this new year. Our Dean? I have to get used to the muting and unmuting. Thank you, Dr. Malone. I would like to introduce today's lecturer, Dr. Philip T.K. Daniel. He is the William Ray and Marie Adamson Fleschner Professor of Educational Administration Emeritus in the Department of Educational Studies, College of Education and Human Ecology here at OSU. He is also the college faculty scholar in residence. Born in Philadelphia, Daniel graduated from Cheney University of Pennsylvania with an honors degree in history and earned his MS and Doctor of Education degrees in educational policy and leadership from the University of Illinois Urbana. He obtained his Juris Doctorate degree from Northern Illinois University College of Law with further study in the School of Law at Catholic University of America in DC. Dr. Daniel was also an American Council on Education Fellow at Washington University in St. Louis. Professor Daniel is the co-author of four books and the author or co-author of over 200 book chapters, peer review articles in national and international journals, articles in law reviews, and papers and keynote addresses presented at national and international conferences. Dr. Daniel has received a number of awards and recognitions, including the Education Law Association Marion McGehee Award, their highest award for research. His work is cited continually in legislation, case law, and appellate briefs. Professor Daniel was awarded Ohio State's Alumni Award for Distinguished Teaching and was inducted into the university's Academy of Distinguished Teaching. He's the winner of the OSU President and Provost Award for Distinguished Faculty Service and is recipient of the OSU Excellence in Mentoring Award from the Office of Diversity. Dr. Daniel was inducted into the Emeritus Academy in 2018 and is now a member of the steering committee. At the OSU Spring 2020 commencement, Dr. Daniel received the Distinguished Service Award. Dr. Daniel is here today to talk to us about maximum extent, appropriate or possible, which is it for placement in the regular classroom. Please welcome Dr. Daniel. Yay. Um, thank you. Where are we? Thank you, Ardeen. And I hope this comes up. No, it should be this one. Can you see that? 
Yes. Okay. Everybody can see that. Can see the PowerPoint. Yes. Um, thank. Thank you again for that wonderful introduction, uh, Professor Nelson. Um, and um, um, just to uh, to build a little bit on uh, my background, um, uh, I uh, our dean indicated that. My publications are, my secondary publications are in peer-reviewed journals as well as in uh, law reviews. Um, the, um, but, but uh, my, my approach in doing a great deal of my research has to do with recommending uh, modification uh, or change. And so, um, uh, one of the things that is important to me is uh, when my work is cited in those who make policy about education. For example, uh, policy uh, uh, being cited in legislation or being cited in regulations or being cited uh, in case law. Uh, and because it seems to me, uh, as professors, we're always after impact. In other words, how, what, how, how, uh, how and under what circumstances do you impact um, with your publications? But I should also say that, um, and, and this is going to be this, this, this represents a, a sort of a foundation of my comments today. Um, um, I also engage in expert witness testimony. Uh, and over time, I have trained uh, administrative law judges. And those are the persons who um, uh, hold court for uh, special education due process uh, hearings. And we, in the state of Ohio, we call them administrative law judges. Having said that, um, I'm really gonna be talking about uh, two cases, two Supreme Court decisions today. Uh, and I'm gonna be referencing one of three um, federal statutes with its accompanying regulations uh, because of uh, where I see issues or what we might be calling problems. So uh, the, this first slide represents um, uh, uh, a section, a paragraph that comes out of um, a, uh, a law review article uh, in the early 1990s. And it, it said that the gist of this comment is this. Um, we've had problems as regards the education of special needs children for a very long time. And I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk more about that. And so access to education uh, demands that uh, certain kinds of activities take place, not the least of which uh, are the enactment of, of statutes. And whenever we're talking about the enactment of statutes or whenever we're, we're talking about elements of the United States Constitution or of a state constitution or of state statutes, we're also going to be talking about how those uh, documents are interpreted and what they mean for policy going forward. And so, uh, my issue today has to do with disabled children's rights, the right to equal protection, the, the, the right to, more importantly, educational opportunity. And of course, if I'm talking about uh, case law, we're also talking about a litigation. The foundation of disability uh, statutes in the United States come from this, these concentric circles. 
very specifically at the bottom is what is known as the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, and it is a state statute, it is a, I'm sorry, a, a federal statute that addresses the needs of children um, in grades uh, 3K through 12, the ages of 3 to 21, the day before a person's 22nd birthday. Um, uh, uh, and it is, if you will, an affirmative action statute. It tells you what you must do. The other two statutes, Section 504 of the Re uh, Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, uh, Act are, uh, civil, are, 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 are um, civil rights statutes. They tell you what you must not do. In other words, on the basis of discrimination, you may not discriminate on the basis of discrimination. And the reach of those statutes is to any disabled person, not just K through 12 students. Uh, it's important to say also in terms of a difference between Section 504 and ADA. Section 504 in terms of discrimination uh, 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 relative to those who are discriminating it can only that that, that entity can m must receive uh, governmental funding. O otherwise, Section 504 doesn't apply. Uh, the Congress, in its wisdom, uh, enacted the Americans with Disabilities Act just for, for that very reason, um, because it also applies to uh, private entities, uh, and, and, and by that we mean those who serve the public. Uh, you can see the sites on the legislation that I just talked about. You also see that what I'm really going to be talking about today are two elements that come out of, um, um, uh, and you, you're going to hear me recite acronyms throughout this presentation, that come out of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. And they are uh, a free appropriate public education or FAPE and least restrictive environment or LRE. Conflicts. Um, IDEA obviously is designed in the way that I've already indicated. But take a look at the second bullet. Um, this, this is a statute that has generated more case law than any other education law in American history. Part of that reason has to do with another element of the statute, and that is uh, both uh, educators and parents being seen as equal partners in addressing the needs of special needs children. Hence, uh, the seed of the conflict. Uh, the, 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 the last bullet that becomes important in terms of my remarks today uh, has to do with the issue of legal literacy uh, among educators and among parents. And I, uh, as you might imagine, hold seminars and workshops for both groups uh, in this area. Uh, the, uh, the important thing to remember about this business of legal literacy, uh, it, it's one that I'm very concerned about. Um, uh, just um, uh, in my teaching, uh, one of the courses that I teach is disability special education law. Um, the, the course always fills up. But my issue has to do with the fact that a lot of educators uh, uh, do, uh, don't take that course. And said it another way, do not have the kind of legal literacy that is important for understanding the statutes and for understanding the case law. Okay, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm, uh, in terms of the way my remarks um, are situated, I'm going to um, run through a brief history of how we got to where we are 
with idea. Um, uh, like the first, like the uh, first slide uh, 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 of this presentation, uh, there was a time up until very recently where ed education for special needs students uh, was non-existent or uh, when it did occur, it occurred in very limited kinds of ways. And uh, what, I, what I have, as you can see um, in this slide, is a statement about, the, or I'm sorry, a site to uh, a North Carolina statute of uh, 1965. And what it did was to authorize criminal charges against parents who persisted in bringing their children to school to be educated. Uh, there were, by the way, uh, statutes like that in quite a number of states um, around the country. Some researchers say this, that a change began to come when the decision in Brown versus Board of Education was decided. I'm sure you all know that Brown was a desegregation case uh, and ruled the public schools, public school districts, separated, uh, uh, separated by race, that separation by race was declared to be inherently unequal. The tone of this case uh, uh, for later developments um, included, in terms of um, ad, uh, advocates for special needs children, advocacy using some of that same language for those children. This moved on to the civil rights movement, same deal. And then in the mid 1960s, the war, mid and eight, uh, mid, uh, mid uh, 1960s, and the latter part of the 60s, the war on poverty, which was uh, 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 um, brought into view by President Lyndon Johnson. And when that happened, uh, the, uh, 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 there was this uh, uh, understanding of how undereducation, social stigma, emotional trauma, etc., was affecting students who were not able to go to school, or if they did go to school, they ran into those problems. Two cases. Pennsylvania Association for Retarded Children versus Pennsylvania and Mills versus the Department or the Board of Education of uh, the District of Columbia brought this into sharp review. And what's important about those two cases is this. They were able to establish the right of a free public education for all children with disabilities. Of course, the problem was that these cases, although decided in favor of those children, uh, were limited to the state of Pennsylvania and the District of Columbia. That profound effect, though, echoed around congressional chambers and ultimately ended up in a statute called the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act. Um, what's important about that particular statute is it brought into view um, the whole notion of a free appropriate public education, which is, which is to be free to students, uh, disabled students, and the least, the least restrictive environment because of the locations, and we're talking about in-school locations, where students would be educated. And like I said, 
I'm going to talk about those today. ECHA, the Education for All, All Handicapped Children's Act, evolved into the um, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And so um, I'm going to, so when I, when I talk about the federal statute, when I talk about the federal statute, I'm going to be talking about um, IDEA. The relative to the, the issue of free appropriate public education and substantive and procedural rights uh, in the statute, it became important to, under, to, to have an understanding as what does a free appropriate public education mean? And the start of answering that question, at least in terms of litigation, occurred in a case called um, Board of Education Hendrick Hudson versus Rowley. And it was the story of a student named Amy Rowley who had um, a hearing impairment, but was a very bright student. Uh, her placement was in a regular classroom. That regular classroom had uh, aids and services that would have been used in a more restrictive classroom, but were brought into the regular education classroom because of this student. Uh, the, uh, 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 she, she, she had a, uh, a sign language interpreter. She had hearing aid. And in addition to that, she could uh, lip read very well. Um, her teachers and the other educators who worked with her uh, took sign language classes. This student um, uh, was 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 uh, faring well, but the other students in the class, and her grades were at about a B plus level. At some point in her education, actually, it was the second year that she was in school. The sign language interpreter indicated that uh, his services were no longer needed. And as a consequence, the school district, through its IEP team, decided to remove that aid from the student's individualized education program or IEP. The parents objected and said, well, what we're after here relative to uh, our child is her being able to do better than B plus because she has the talent to do so. And so as a consequence, what they were saying, they, what they did was to interpret the idea statute to mean that um, what educators should be doing for this student is maximizing her education. This case went through the lower courts uh, all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And the site that you see on this slide, that is a Supreme Court site. And uh, the, 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 what the court did in that, in that case was to address the two questions that you see before you. Uh, ultimately, this meant essentially whether the student, the special needs student, was getting the aids and services necessary uh, to uh, move through the system. And, and, and in fact, whether she was getting the kind of benefit that allowed her to progress. Reaction to what was happening in this case. And you will see the term ambiguity. You're going to see that term more than once in terms of my presentation. Um, uh, one of our own, uh, Ruth Calker, who is a professor in the Drinko College of Law here at OSU, uh, raised this question. And the question was, what is the model for faith? 
And because she said, if the model is Amy Rowley, then what we're talking about is a student who were not only receiving the necessary uh, aids and services for her to progress um, in school, but it's also a person who has um, uh, a disability that will allow for that progression and at the same time allow for her to be in a regular classroom. And so for the next 35 years, up until 2017, that in fact is the model that we use. What is that model? Because if you see the, 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 the bullet, the second bullet in that slide, how lower courts interpreted the sum benefit standard or the sum benefit model. And uh, be, uh, and, and once again, if we, if we harken back to Amy Rowley, what, what her situation means is she didn't need a lot of intervention. Uh, she, was a, she, she, was a, she was okay under, the, under her circumstances to, as I indicated, maintain or do better than her regular uh, uh, classroom peers. And so some benefit worked, um, even if those benefits were minimal. Well, what school districts tended to do at states and school districts tended to do after that was to apply that model across the board. And what do we mean by across the board? We mean a continuum of alternative placements that begins on one side with what we call the least restrictive environment and we'll call that a classroom. On the other end of that continuum is uh, 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 environments that are more, much more restrictive. Some of those environments, by the way, are hospitals. Some of those are 24 hour a day care. And then you have all of those in the middle. Well, in effect, the rally model was the one that was essentially being used and as I said, the question becomes this. In terms of a student's progress, the term being used is some educational benefit. And there were school districts that thought of that as being the most de minimis benefit, meaning the least, um, or um, uh, minimal educational benefit. And so if you take a look at the last bullet, uh, that statement still applies, meaning that this doctrine still has legs in 2020. There were concerns and a good deal of litigation. I've already spoken to that. A whole bunch of litigation in the meantime, because parents were claiming parents with students whose disabilities were greater than Amy Rowley's, were claiming that relative to a free appropriate public education or FAPE, their students were not being appropriately educated. And so the issue that came up in a, another case, it's called um, Andrew F. versus Douglas County. You can see the site there. Uh, once again, rose up through the ranks of the lower courts. The school districts um, along the way were all affirmed by those lower courts. But that case was overturned by the Supreme Court. And, and you can see the issue, whether fate means more than just de minimis or slightly more than trivial. Because that's what students were, that's, where, that's what a great many students were receiving. Unlike Amy Rowley, uh, relative to uh, her uh, residual hearing disability, uh, Andrew F. Um, uh, was an autistic student. He also was an ADHD student, um, which means that 
uh, in class and in school, you know, a great many behavioral issues. What was the complaint from the parents about, uh, about Andrew F? Is individualized education program or IEP, they were concerned that he wasn't making any, he, he was making little academic progress and his behavioral problems continued. What were those behavioral problems? And uh, a nutshell, um, he'd climb over desks, he'd climb over students, he'd scream, he'd jump up and down. And um, the parents were saying, um, uh, uh, we need to change that IEP uh, without waiting to find out whether it was going to be changed since it hadn't changed in five years. They moved Andrew F., they moved their son to a private school that addressed autism issues. And what happened when that, uh, when that occurred is this, the, the academic progress of the student became better. His behavior also became more positive. If you take a look uh, down the slide to see the court response, and this is important information. It isn't enough to give um, a de minimis education to a student. In fact, that worked well for Amy Rowley because of who she was. But now the court is saying, when you have students with greater disabilities that impact their learning, and look at the quote, it must be appropriately ambition in light, ambitious rather, in light of the student's circumstances, and, end of quote, and, more markedly demanding than merely more than de minimis, offering the student the opportunity to meet, like other students, challenging objectives. And uh, then what the court did was to scold the school district. A student offered an educational program providing merely more than de minimis progress from year to year and hardly be said to have been offered an education at all. The next bullet is where I am in terms of talking about FAPE today. The Supreme Court did not overrule itself in rally. It simply clarified rally. The problem comes because of the confusion and the resultant need for more litigation, um, more clarity rather, and more litigation. Let's talk about both students in terms of comparisons. Both students were special needs students. Both students, um, in terms of the issue that is in conflict, involved free appropriate public education. Both students were seen in positive ways. Um, and you can see those without my going forward with that. The differences between the two students um, Amy Rowley, hearing impaired, but an excellent lip reader, in a regular class, on par or better than her, 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 her student peers. Parents wanted the sign language interpreter the school district refused. And as, a, as you, as um, um, was said in previous slides, the court actually cited in favor of the, the rally court, you know, not the Andrew F court, the rally court decided in favor of the school district because what it said was relative to this student, um, 
what, what, what was happening is that uh, all of the procedural elements of the statute had been satisfied. In other words, did she get an appropriate IEP? Did she get the agent services that she needed? And so on and so forth. And uh, but, 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 but then the question became, after that, was she able to, for example, meet state standards and move from grade to grade? And the answer to that question was, well, heck, if she's um, uh, working on par or better than a regular education students, we had an answer to that question already. The crossover and look at Andrew F. We've already talked about his students, uh, his, his, uh, his disabilities. By the way, his disabilities were not limited to those two. He had been placed in a regular classroom uh, initially, but because of his behavioral issues, his ADHD, um, there, was con there, were, there was concern about uh, how the education of other students was being affected. And so that's when the school district and its IEP team decided to move him to a more restrictive uh, setting. Um, the parents objected to that. Um, the, the one reason that the school district also had concerns about um, Andrew F. being in a regular classroom, he had personal needs, and I don't think I need to go into that. Uh, and one of the things he used to do was to jump up and shout and run around the room in addition to that. Um, because of that, uh, uh, many of the students reacted negatively to him. And so he did not engage with them. And, um, and because of his disabilities, you will see that he has compulsive, continuing, and maladaptive behaviors. Parents want a new IEP. They really didn't wait for it. Five years had been enough for them. And so they decided that uh, they were going to move ahead to a private school. Issues. What were the issues confronting each of these courts? For rally, whether fate means performing at an adequate level, having an opportunity to achieve full potential. Um, and the court answered that question, as I've already indicated. Um, it, yes, fate does mean performing at an adequate level, but it doesn't mean that school districts have to educate children to their full potential. I'm going to say that again. It doesn't mean that school districts have a responsibility to educate children at their full potential. The reason why I'm stopping there is really to sort of ask a question. And that is, as regards regular education students, whether school districts have an opportunity to educate them to their full potential. I don't know if you know the answer to that question, but you might want to think about it. Uh, relative to NUF, this was the issue in that Supreme Court decision. What is the level of educational benefit relative to faith that school districts must confer on children with disabilities? Court response in each of the cases. Uh, for, for, uh, for Amy Rowley, uh, let me also stop there for a minute because um, I meant to say this before. Um, Amy Rowley is a professor. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of Wisconsin and she teaches currently in one of the California state institutions to show you the kind of student that she was and how the model was built. She received substantial services uh, We've already talked about how she performed. Uh, and uh, 
she, obviously she met the sum benefit standard. In fact, she set the, the sum benefit standard. She was the model. And the court said, as I indicated before, the FAPE does not require maximizing a child's potential. Andrew F., he could not be integrated in the regular classroom. And so what the court is saying in that case is that any IEP developed for a special needs student must have a different focus than what was essentially the platform for FAPE uh, all the way up until that 2017 case, which was uh, the model was advancing from grade to grade and meeting state standards. And this is what the court said. It must be appropriately ambitious for this student and this student's circumstances, markedly more demanding than just some benefit. And then, of course, the court agreed that we don't have to maximize a student's potential. Salient points. And this is where my research comes into play. Um, and as a matter of fact, excuse me, for all of what I'm going to say, um, my research is not complete. What it's almost complete and what will happen is I will begin using it to do the kind of seminars and, um, and workshops that I talked about. Um, I will be using it relative to uh, the due process, hearing, due process hearing training I talked to you about. The problem comes from the court's confusion in the rally case. Um, um, uh, I'm sorry, in the Andrew F case. Uh, and, and, the, and the term that I'm going to talk about in the Andrew F case also appeared a couple of times in the rally case. Um, uh, uh, but in, in, in terms of this particular slide, Andrew F, according to the court, expands rally. Okay, the one change is that continuum of disabilities, whereby a FAPE uh, and an IEP for the student from FAPE must address that particular student based on that particular student's disabilities. In other words, all children with disabilities, not just the Amy's of the world, must make progress in school that is more than de minimis. Hence, Andrew F., ladies and gentlemen, did not overrule Rowley. That has produced you see the word again, ambiguity. Why? Um, the, the, what ended up happening is um, between the two cases, a question arose for school districts. Which of these standards do we use? The court didn't clarify whether the school districts were compelled to use one decision over the other. And this is where my research comes in, ladies and gentlemen. Take a look at the next bullet. Currently, we have over 147 special education due process hearings or lower court decisions on appeal following the bullets that you see below. What I did was to take these decisions and category, uh, ca categorize them. And as you can see, there are three categories. Look at number one. Some school districts interpret Andrew F as 
um, being equal to Rally or Rally being equal to Andrew F. What does that mean? Of course, what that means is the court, of course, I'm mean, sorry, the school district recognizes Andrew F as establishing a new FAPE standard, but it equates that standard with its prior articulations of the Rally standard. Another set of these hearings, hearing decisions or lower court decisions clarifies Rally, um, recognizing that Andrew F does modify Rally, but still grounds its analysis in Rally rather than Andrew F. And then finally, a group of, uh, of uh, hearing hearing decisions or cases. And by the way, this is the, this is the least amount of the lot where the court recognizes Andrew F um, that it uh, uh, articulates a new substantive safe standard. And in effect, any decisions that that school district had made in, that, in the past may no longer apply if what they used was the rally standard. That issue relative to fate and the decision in rally, but more importantly, the decision in Andrew F uh, addresses itself to um, another portion of the idea statute and its regulations, of course, what we call least restrictive environment. We've been talking about least restrictive environment, uh, but I'm going to be talking about it in the way that I have, but also expressing uh, more than a little bit of difference. One of the most important, one of the most important tenets of idea. Uh, when one of the uh, 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 LRE is one of the most important tenets of tenets of idea, and gives faith its sustenance for all children. Because it, the question that is being asked is, what is the placement for this student? What is the least restrictive environment for this student? And so, if you look, if you take a look at the next two bullets. Um, what you see is a student can be removed from a regular classroom only to the extent that uh, the, uh, the special education services, aids and services that would have been offered in a more restrictive classroom cannot be brought into the regular classroom so that this student can in fact advance. Um, and please note the third bullet. There's a bias by the Congress that students should, should first and foremost be placed in regular classes. Okay. And then take a look at the last bullet. Um, the statute allows for students to be placed along that uh, continuum that I talked about. Um, for example, they could be placed in a room for special needs students that we call resource rooms, where they could be placed in separate facilities. But all of this depends upon the nature of the student's disabilities. Uh, and, and the question will always be the same. Based on that setting or based on that placement, can, achieve, can, a, student be, can, achieve, can a student achieve satisfactorily? Uh, with those aids and services. And it's essentially, that's the foundation of the statute. There's some confusion because the statute says, if you take a look at the last bullet, is that when it comes to 
um, fake than least restrictive environment. Students, uh, to the maximum extent appropriate, be educated, so special needs students, to the maximum extent appropriate, are educated with students who are not disabled. And um, what has happened is um, the court, the Supreme Court, did not uh, 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 vacillate between using the term appropriate and using the term possible. A number of lower courts picked up on that. And look at what's going on here. This is, this is TK talking. Uh, this presents a false impression when those two terms are interchanged. Because the difference in language it's not, I mean, these two are not synonymous terms. Why? Look at the third bullet. Possible represents a higher standard, strongly suggesting the full extent whereby school districts must exhaust every avenue for placing a disabled child in a regular classroom, despite the severity of that student's disability. Whereas appropriate, which is, a, 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 which is essentially what was intended in the statute, as a, a, a narrower meaning determined by, determined by the uniqueness of the child and where that child uh, 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 may progress in this uh, uh, prescribed environment. And so uh, when, when we look back at that slide that I gave you on litigation, this is where it lies. Uh, where parents are saying, no, 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 no. You've got to give my children or my child more than that. This has created confusion. And this is essentially, this, is, this represents the next slide. State statutes. I found four state statutes that use the possible language, okay? Four out of our 50 states use that term as a consequence of the Andrew F. decision because of the changes that were made. But we'll take a look at this one. Look at this, this slide. Uh, we have 11, uh, uh, in the United States, uh, our system of courts are divided by um, trial courts. Uh, at the federal level, we call trial courts district courts. At the intermediate appellate level, we call those circuit courts. And then we go to um, Supreme Courts. What this tells us about our due process rights, ladies and gentlemen, is that if you, if you feel as though you didn't go, get the appropriate redress at the district court level, you can appeal to an immediate appeals court. I'm sorry, an, an intermediate appeals court. And if you feel as though you didn't get appropriate redress at that level, you can appeal your case to the Supreme Court. But take a look at this information. Six of the 11 uh, intermediate appeals courts have used that term, possible as opposed to appropriate. And that's why the conflict is at that court. I also found, you can imagine that I couldn't fit 50 cases on this one slide, uh, that there are 50 district courts, trial courts, using the term possible. And essentially, that's where we are. And that's where 
my research is. Um, um, and, and, and so when I'm finished with that research, this is the finish that I'm going to uh, be talking about. Andrew S. reminds us of what we've known for years. There is an I in IEP. There is an A in appropriate. The standard is not the P, impossible a higher standard that strongly suggests that to the full extent whereby school districts must exhaust every avenue for placing a disabled child. In, in other words, giving that child uh, uh, aids and services that the word appropriate may not command. My current recommendations to school districts. What is the standard? What is the FAPE standard? What is the LRE standard for your state's Department of Education? Have you updated your plans to address these? And by the way, I also realize these may vacillate um, uh, as, as, uh, because of the problems that I've raised and the changes that may occur. Um, the third bullet, uh, uh, do you understand what is happening in your school district and what is happening relative to moving forward with school district policies and procedures? Because if you don't, you should. And how will we do that? Ongoing training professional development and special education based on not just the issue of special education, but all of the legal foundation that I have been talking about in my presentation uh, today. Uh, if there is a change, be prepared for making, for, 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 for uh, uh, applying the new standard uh, to your IEPs. We're not only talking about special education teachers. We're also talking about regular education teachers. We're talking about administrators and we're talking about paraprofessionals. And then of course, develop an infrastructure for monitoring, evaluation and correction. Thank you very much. I will, uh, I will unmute myself and applaud for everyone here. I can see everyone doing it. Um, we've had, thank you so much. Uh, wow, what a huge conundrum. Um, there's been a couple questions that have occurred and changed through the process here of your discussion. Um, can you see your chat? Do you want me to read them to you? Yeah, but I, uh, I'm, I'm going up to my board here and chat is not on there. Wait a minute, hold it, wait a minute, more, more, more. Just, just next see. to the share screen button. Oh. Just left of the share screen button. I can, I can read them to you. It might be a good idea because I don't have that on 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 my on my screen. Uh, uh, on you. Okay. Go ahead. Read them. Okay. Um, I'm also thinking that oh, suddenly I got big over here. <laughs> um, I almost think I should go backwards because well, I'm going to go with Joe's um, because he altered it part way through. What are the most frequent forms of conflicts and disagreements between the schools and parents about addressing the needs of disabled children in school settings today when compared to the times when the, Joe, do you ever put a period in here? Um, compared to the time when the various pieces of legislation were first developed. In other words, what are the legs on these issues today? Um, I. Uh, I, I, I don't have the slide, and I hope I can remember as many as I possibly can. 
there are a number of elements of, um, of idea uh, that are litigated. Um, uh, so let me begin and try to remember off the top of my head as many as there are. Um, we, we, we have something fairly new today. Um, 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 involving child fine. And essentially what that means is that school districts have a responsibility um, of identifying, locating, and evaluating students with special needs. Uh, uh, part of that is addressed by what we call response to intervention. And that issue has to do with uh, whether children are in fact misidentified. Uh, I should tell you that uh, that is, is fairly new and came about in the Congress because of racial and, 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 and ethnicity issues. Because we found so many students of color being referred to special education. Uh, but what, what, what RTI or response to intervention tells us is that um, what, uh, uh, what we are to do that is different from the past in terms of the question that was raised by Joe is there's got to be scientific data relative to evaluating students. And by the way, the persons who are carrying on those evaluations uh, <clears throat> are made up mostly of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of regular education teachers. And in effect, relative to RTI, do we have, uh, have, have we appropriately evaluated a student to determine whether that student in fact is a special needs student? We move over, we move from there to the issue of eligibility. And that's why I presented those first three, I'm sorry, I presented those all three statutes. Because one of the questions that I often ask in my class on disability special education law is when a disabled student, not a special needs student, when is a disabled student, not a special needs student? The definition of eligibility under IDEA has three elements. First of all, whether the student as one of the federally recognized disabilities. Second of all, whether that disability or those disabilities have an adverse impact upon the student's learning. And then third of all, that's when you determine uh, whether the student is entitled uh, to uh, the kind of intervention that I've been talking about in my presentation today. And that's when we would call that student a special needs student, as opposed to just a disabled student. So for example, you can imagine that, if, that, that uh, like myself, having at one time had a broken leg, I was disabled because of the nature of the injury. And so I was a, dis a, a disabled person, but I didn't need special intervention as regards a fate or an IEP or an LRE, uh, okay? We move from there to uh, re relative to, from, from FAPE to talk about what we just talked about today also, at least it's a free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. And how do we arrange that? We arrange that through individualized education uh, programs or IEPs. And by the way, should I stop? Because I could keep going. <laughs> because there are a lot of different components of, of, of idea, but that may be, uh, let, me, let me just say this. Uh, another element of idea that is very important uh, relates to procedural safeguards. And procedural safeguards gets into the issue of remedies and 
uh, in in the um, um, in in idea, the remedy, by the way, is limited to a compensatory remedy. In other words, if the student was not adequately educated, then you've got to adequately educate the student. If the student was not adequately placed, then you've got to adequately place the student. And by the way, this also gives parents certain kinds of rights. And, and, and there's where you see, Joe, a great deal of the uh, litigation where parents have decided unilaterally on a, 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 a great deal of the time to take their children out of public school and put them in private school and, and require that the school district supply the tuition uh, for, the, for the private school. Um, okay, so I stop there or should I keep going with that line of, uh, of uh, of analysis. Well, I, th I, th I think you probably answered it pretty darn well. Um, James <laughs> probably wrote too much. Sort of a question early on and then change it. And um, I, uh, our, our Dean, I can't read, hear you. But he mentioned that he, You're breaking you up. Can't hear me? You're breaking up. I, really? Sorry. Okay, um, now, now I'll I hear try you. again. Yeah. Jake. Okay, move closer to the, my mic. Um, James had to leave, but he thought the cases were very instructive and uh, and very helpful for him to understand. Um, I don't think I see any other questions. I have one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Go um, ahead. And this has to do with the cases that you talked about. The parents were, I'll say, fighting for their kids. Right. There are times where parents really don't or don't recognize that there's an issue um, or they want to deny the issue that they don't want their child labeled. What happens in those cases? Well, there, there's more than one answer um, because it, it, it sounds to me like uh, what you're saying is um, do parents have the responsibility for ensuring that their children are evaluated for a disability? And the first answer I want to give to that is, this is what I'm, before when I talked about child fine, relative to child fine, that responsibility is the school district responsibility. Oftentimes, by the way, um, uh, uh, e even though school districts may try as they might, they don't always get it right. Now let's move over to the parents. The um, the uh, it is important to note that parents certainly have the right not to have their children evaluated for special needs. But if, we're, if what we're talking about is a public school, and for example, you have a student like Angelette. The question becomes, what does one do? In other words, if this children, if this child is going to be in school, is going to be in a placement in school, how do you address that? Um, I, there's there's more than one answer, but let me give you the one that uh, I often suggest uh, to school personnel. Uh, depending on <laughs> uh, which side of things I'm being asked to address as an expert witness. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, due process. A special education due process hearing. Where the, where the, where the, where the, where the school district is arguing that we have a response, we have a constitutional we have a statutory responsibility of educating this student. It cannot happen in a way that is going to represent um, a benefit for this student. If this student has not been evaluated, has not had an IEP developed for her or him, is not, does not have a faith, and is, and is not in an appropriate setting, 
And so the, 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 you, you realize this is an argument. This is litigate, this is, well, it's, it's, it's statutory litigation, let's put it that way. Uh, if we're talking about a due process hearing where uh, the, the parent is being compelled to have their student, if it's gonna be in a public school, evaluate so that they can be appropriately educated. So that's my answer. Okay. Any other questions from anyone? Turn your mic on and ask. Calling once, twice, three times. Okay, there we go. Okay, thank, thank you. you so thank very you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Um, I guess we just all leave now, right? <laughs> Unless